The airmen who make up Air Force Special Warfare are the most specialized warriors on the planet. They are the ones other special forces look to when the mission calls for their unique skills and fearless commitment. A job for the mentally tough and physically strong, these elite heroes go where others won't because they're trained to do what others can't. Our partnership, the U.S. Air Force Special Warfare Division, brings you three episodes taking you behind the lines with the U.S. Air Force Special Warfare, their training, their mission, and how the strongest elite warriors on the planet get better. Oops, a mile and a half run, two 25 meter underwaters, and a 500 meter freestyle swim slick. Um, I Wait, don't what's have the, the slick part? Uh, no fins. Oh, cool. No fins, no snorkel, no anything. So, how um, many pull ups? Eight pull ups, I believe. I'm looking so over far, my so good, I, I so far, so good, Doug. I don't have so good in front of me. Yeah. So far, so good. What's the mile and a half? Mile and a half is 1020, I believe. We're good. You're good. You're I passed in? level one. Let's get it. Yeah. You, you got everything else. If, if you're if you have kids, the, the grit and determination and sleep depth, you're already there. That's a that's a skill you learn later in life, though. I would I don't know if I'd have had that at 18. Um, right. The the underwater training is always a super interesting th- thing to me. I've uh, you you mentioned the two 25 yards underwater. Is it 25 meters? Um, I actually do that workout when the summer is here in the pool, but I do it 20 times underwater it's one of my favorite workouts of all time um right. doesn't beat you up you get to train your brain you're like underwater thinking wondering if you're going to make it to the other end like rep 15 through 20 is not the simplest thing in the world um right how do, do you guys run into many people that are like just very uncomfortable underwater now and, and if so how do, how do you get them more comfortable uh in very uncomfortable situations I think for most people, because water is one of those few things I think that initiates that fight or flight just yeah. naturally in all of us, you know, so sp- you just need to spend more time in the pool and understand that it's just exercise. And I know for me personally, I was not a strong swimmer in the beginning, uh, but then one thing clicked in my head, right? Like I could run. And so as I run, I have a cadence with how I breathe. And mm-hmm. then when I, I realized that as I was swimming, there was a cadence to how I, I was breathing and a rhythm to it. And, and water is a funny thing. It's like, putting out hard exercise, you know, you're trying hard, but also 90% of its form, uh, form. And, and, and when it comes to the underwaters is, uh, relaxing and not burning off your O2 faster than you have to, and yeah. just having that confidence that you're going to make it to the other side. The, uh, the drown proofing seems, uh, I would imagine for many people is like the hardest aspect because it's the hardest thing to train. Uh, it's, if you're by yourself, you, everybody can get up and go run and do push-ups, pull-ups, find a gym. But it's really challenging to go push yourself um, underwater. You want to breathe. Breathing's important. Right. I mean, a lot of people may have never heard that term, drown proofing. Is, is that what you guys call it? I think that's what they call it the Navy SEALs. Do you guys call it the same thing? Do you have a similar process for that? Yeah, so drown proofing is a, a specific event um, in, in the, the training. So that's when you'll, when you see the pictures of the people with their, their hands tied behind their backs and their, their feet tied together and they jump in and you bob from the bottom to the top. And then there's a few other, other, other exercises that come along the back into that. Um, that's what drown proofing is. And really that's a, that's a pretty high pass event. You just need to relax. And once you, you figure out that rhythm, just like anything else, um, it's, it's pretty calming. If you're in like in a 10 foot pool and you just blow all your bubbles out and go to the bottom and come back up and you just keep doing that, you realize pretty quickly that you're not going to die and, it, and it's relaxing. This is why I wanted to come out so badly because I uh, have done that specific thing. And once you just calm down, it's actually really, it's like super relaxing like you're talking about. But the first time you do it, uh, I've done it while carrying like 40 pound dumbbells as well, which kind of makes it a little bit easier because you kind of float a little bit at the top. But there's a, it's, it's very interesting though, forcing yourself to calm down. Right. while you're doing everything well and and this th- that perfect event in particular has like one of those little mind things that i like to do with people is people see the peak the, the the candidates with their hands tied and their feet tied together and they're like that looks scary and to me <laughs> All right. that's just less o2 that i have to burn holding my hands and my legs together as i go to the bottom of the pool anybody that's felt that as you're going to the bottom of the pool and your legs want to come apart and your your arms are going to move around and, and create more drag 
once you take that out of the equation, all I have to do is go straight up and straight down. How um, many so, reps is it that you guys have to do in that, in that test? It's a, it's a timed event. Um, so it's like, uh, I think a minute of bobbing and then you're, you're going to move around a little bit and, uh, go to the bottom, pick up a mask off the bottom of the pool with your teeth and come back up. Heck. But Doug, we missed that, out, bud. Yeah, it's a good event. So what, uh, do you see many people not pass kind of these, I, I would imagine these are like the entry level underwater tests. Um, right. most people get through that. It's a pretty high pass rate. You were saying. Yeah, for, for the, the drown proofing itself, uh, when we get into uh, some of the other events, is, is you're going to see your high attrition events. Um, once you start throwing uniforms on people in the water and your, your buddy breathing, all that kind of stuff. So uh, these are the things that that 18-year-old needs to start thinking about while they're spending time in the pool. They don't necessarily need to do it and probably recommend not trying to swim with a uniform on before you get here. Yeah. Uh, but just having that, that water comfort so that you get over that first hurdle. And everybody knows once you get over that first hurdle, that second hurdle doesn't seem so bad. Uh, but you need to be well on your way to making progress towards that goal. Yeah. Do you guys do like swim training? Is that, is that part of, or do you just expect people to have the basic skill before they get there? So they, we have uh, developers, a lot of retired uh, beret wearing folks out there that we we've hired to work with the recruiters to train people before they even get here. So we train them before they get here and in, in concert with the recruiting effort, then they go through basic training and then we send them through the prep course uh, over at the special warfare training wing for eight weeks to prep them some more. And then we put them to the crucible event. Um, so we want to make sure that if you are the right candidate and you have the right mindset and you just had a hard time training or, or you had a couple things you need to get over, we're going to give you every chance for success. Um, but at the end of the day, the standard is the standard. And if you don't make it, you don't make it. There may be a lot of people that think about the air force and don't specifically think I need to train to be a better swimmer, to be a part of the air force or special operations. Like what, why is this component so important? Why is it emphasized so much? So one of the things that the air force uh, special operations community does is we embed with a lot of sister service teams. So if you are attached to a green beret team, a seal team, or any of those guys, and they are, it's a dive mission or a dive requirement. We send our guys through dive school so that we can integrate with any other team out there. Uh, we have some stuff that we do on our own, but all, uh, a big part of what we do is, is uh, help those other teams out and provide a capability that they might not have internally. Um, so we're kind of like the jack of all trades. We, we can go out there and integrate with whoever we need to integrate with and, and get the mission accomplished. Nice. You mentioned, was it the crucible event? The, the assessment and selection. We is, don't call it the crucible, the, the crux of the course or the pipeline or whatever. Wait, the, is that the underwater test we were just talking about? Or is it all together? Or is that totally negative. separate? So you're going to go through prep. And then after prep, you're going to go through assessment and selection. There is some water in assessment and selection. Uh, but after assessment and selection is when you go to your pre-dive course, where you're going to hit that water stuff really hard and heavy uh, and, and, and get those tools to be able to relax. And um, a, a lot of it is is not necessarily the, the comfort in the water that they're lacking at that point. It's just the going through the motions and getting those specific line items out of the way, those training events out of the way and getting that coordination down. Just like you could be strong enough to bench press, you know, 315 pounds, but if you don't have the coordination, you know, if you've never bench yeah. pressed before, you're still going to have to work your way up and, and learn that coordination. Is this stuff generally easy to recruit for? You know, like people kind of idolize special operations guys, you know, there's movies about, about Navy SEALs and Army Rangers and, and Air Force guys, et cetera. Like, People think it's cool. Uh, I would think a lot of guys want to be a part of that, even more so than people that just want to be in the military. They want to be like the special people in the military. So uh, do you guys always have a, a full pipeline or is it, is it hard to get uh, qualified candidates in there on, on a regular basis? I'm, I'm not a recruiter, I, so I can't really speak to how hard it is to get people in the door, uh, but we do have a high level interest. You know, it, it does appeal to a lot of people, um, but just no matter how cool you think it is or, or how, you know, however Hollywood depicts special operations where it's always just kicking in doors and doing whatever mm -hmm. you, you have to do all the hard work. And, and the reason that people walk around in the community and, and may seem a little um, uh, sure of themselves all the time is because the, the job is hard and never stops being hard. So you get through the selection, you get through all the training events, you get to team and the job is still difficult and a lot is expected of you. So um, it's not all just, you know, Charlie Sheen jumping onto a car to head to a wedding, you know, that's, that's <laughs> not what it is. It's, it's hard work just like anything else. And the, the harder your work, the cooler stuff you get to do. Uh, have you noticed a 
uh, like the fitness level of the average person coming in. Uh, I, I know that our, our country is not the healthiest uh, country in the world, um, but have you noticed like the, the standard of uh, fitness that is coming in to the Air Force or, or uh, attempting to become in the special ops? Has it stayed the same, increased? Uh, do you guys have like a, a selection pool that kind of like weeds itself out by the time people get to you? Yes. So after they go see the recruiter, if they're physically, um, you know, signed off or they meet all the requirements to go work out, the people coming in the door today are incredibly physically fit, you know, and after they get through the prep course. Um, so the, the physicality, I don't think is the problem right now. It's, um, it's everything else that we expect them to do on top of that. So I'm not saying that we have like a huge problem in any one area, but uh, you, you go over to the prep course and you look at these, these candidates about to graduate and they're monsters. You yeah. Know, they, they, we, like you, I think you talked about it earlier today, the nutrition, the psych, the prep, like all the equipment that we have out there for them to do and, and the coaches that we've hired uh, to get these candidates to the highest physical level possible in that amount of time um, that they're prepared. Yeah. And you guys have three, I don't actually know a ton about the three different categories that special operations in, uh, in the air force works. Can you dig into just kind of each track that people can go down um, and then kind of the special requirements for each of them? So all, all of our candidates come in under an open uh, special warfare contract, Air Force Special Warfare contract, and you can be a, a TACP, a pararescueman, a combat controller, or a special reconnaissance. And so at the end of the prep course, because TACP has a little bit of a different track, uh, the, the people that have been designated as TACPs, they go off to their own uh, pipeline here in San Antonio, and they, they perform their training. The airmen who make up Air Force Special Warfare are the most specialized warriors on the planet. They are the ones other special forces look to when the mission calls for their unique skills and fearless commitment. A job for the mentally tough and physically strong, these elite heroes go where others won't because they're trained to do what others can't. Our partnership, the U.S. Air Force Special Warfare Division, brings you three episodes taking you behind the lines of the U.S. Air Force Special Warfare, their training, their mission, and how the strongest elite warriors on the planet get better.